Hello and good evening my local drones, this is I, Bo Gundam, and I'm back again for another video. So today, me and Fulminatus and a new guy, Heraculus, we're going to be doing a video, talking. we're going to be doing a podcast talking about Macross 7. But before we continue, um, can my lovely gents introduce themselves? Well, I'm not lovely, so that doesn't include me. I'm, uh, you must be talking about Heraclius. Uh, maybe. <laughs> go ahead, man, you go first. Sure, uh, I'm Heraculus. Uh, I came in from a uh, good student's little... Uh anime server where I've also been doing some uh, a lot of podcasts and mostly I'm responsible for us doing a lot of Gundam podcasts so if you want to yes, listen to, to my me, to my joy um, I am actually halfway through G Gundam at the moment so I should be ready for next week yeah I, I, I haven't even started so I need to get to watching that uh, personally I am a long time mecha fag, long time lover of mecha anime, that's most of my background, but I also enjoy like sci-fi, that type of mecha stuff, anime stuff, uh, fantasy, etc, anything like that. Yeah. The, the old high concept, almost like Ava standard, yeah, I, I, I guess. Okay, cool. Say. Yeah, so I, I brought in Heraculus today because, you know, I was talking about Macross, and we figured, um, why don't we bring a third person into these casts, and, you know, also, this will make a good test to see how Heraculus does on the channel, and maybe we'll have around um, him around for future podcasts. Uh, I do remember talking to him uh, in DMs a while back about we might do Transformers Beast Wars and Beast Machines. Um, I know it's not anime, but it would be an interesting show to cover. We, we might end up doing it on Good Students' channel, who knows. Um, yeah, especially because that show in particular, Beast Wars, Wars, is responsible for nearly all the like mythology and technical stuff of like what Transformers is right now. Like, I, I, I mean, called? we might have to cover G One as well. We might, we might cover G One as well, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna discuss. Well, technically, because Transformers Generation One counts as anime because the whole Japanese drawing, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Transformers is an interesting beast in itself, but that's not what we're here for. So today we're here for for Macross 7. Uh, now, Macross 7 has the very interesting reputation of being considered <laughs> the sort of black sheep of the Macross franchise. Uh... <laughs> yes, Macross 7. Yes. I never watched this. I have... Oh, wait. I go, I'm sorry, go ahead. It. Okay. I'd never watched this before then. I'd watched every other Macross iteration. Ball Macross 2, because it's non-canonical. And uh, this Macross, and I hadn't watched it. And I basically heard, oh, it's silly, there's a lot of singing, there's too much focus on idols, etc. And in a certain degree, it is silly, you might say. But at the same time, this is also a show that in other ways takes itself very, very seriously. It's not trying to be a completely wacky comedy like, say, Double Zeta Gundam. This is a show. I mean, I mean at, that least in, in, at least in Macron 7's case, the opening song was This is not an anime. This is not an anime. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you mean yeah, Double Zeta well, Gundam? Yeah, Double yes. Zeta. At least yeah, they didn't have an opening Gundam. like that. Yeah, d yeah, Double Zeta had like an opening just to tell you to throw out all expectations, essentially. Although, although um, speaking of Double Zeta, Silent Voice is fucking great. Yeah, uh, okay. Well, yeah, the, the uh, second excellent. half of the show, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we're not here for that. D uh, Double Zeta took a lot out of me, because I was plowing through Gundam this fall, and after Double Zeta, I was like, ah. Oh. I, I, <laughs> I watched Char's Counterattack, and, and I'm like, all right, I'm good for quite some time. <laughs> Uh, see, yeah, by, anyway. the end, by the end of Double Zeta, I was practically singing Anime Janai along with the cast. But anyways... Uh, <laughs> yeah, though, Macro 7 is kind of the... The, the thing is, okay, it, it's had this reputation for quite some time. Um, because they, I'm, I'm, I'm the old head in the room, right? Uh, I, I remember being in, like, first and second grade watching Robotech. Uh, and... By the time I became aware that it was Robotech was actually like three different shows and the original was just straight up called Macross, um, there was a, a little, this is back in the age of VHS, by the way, there, there was a little shop called like Suncoast Video at the mall and uh, it had a Japanimation section. Oh, this one, uh, yeah, the story. Yeah, and I remember seeing all kinds of stuff on VHS. And one of the shows was called Macross 7. And I was scratching my head. It's like, well, oh, this is interesting. And there's a fuckload of these tapes. And, um, you know, this is back when, like, uh, um, an anime VHS was, like, $20 for two episodes, which translates to roughly, I guess, with inflation, something like 30-some 
35 or 36 dollars today and like if you want a dub you were going to pay the extra 10 bucks so it's like 30 so that's like 58 bucks today or thereabouts for two episodes subbed so like just to give you an idea of how much these things cost uh and the thing is they were always missing like the first two episodes so I never got into the show because I always wanted to start from the beginning until a lot later. Uh, and then I finally, much later, you know, when, you know, this stuff was like e available online and didn't take like two hours to download an episode because um, the speeds were better. I finally got around to watching Macross 7. And the first time I tried, I got like two episodes in and I was like, what the hell is this shit? Because it starts off solid enough and then... You know, Basra gets in the gets in the robot and goes out and he s starts singing while yeah. there's a friggin' space battle going on. And I'm like, the hell is this crap? Yeah, like, the, fir I, the I, first I, I, episode, for context, opens with just sort of like the layabouts of a band and everything that they're doing. Yeah. And then all of a sudden there's a space battle and the main singer of the band goes, okay, I'm going to jump in my giant robot that turns into a plane. I'm going to fly out into that, into space, and I'm going to sing at the enemy. And that's the first episode. Yeah, and I, and I think, for you've talked about something really interesting about Macross 7 is that that first episode is... Is quite is quite the ball or ball breaker for a lot of people getting in the show. Like when I first watched that it episode, is. I had the same reaction. I'm like, wait, what? What the fuck is he doing? There, yeah, there was a saying I remember when I was in college. Um, uh, friends don't let friends watch Macross Seven, <laughs> and I was like, it, 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 after I went back and gave the show a second try, I was like, man, they really needed to say friends don't let friends watch Macross too, because that was way worse than this. Um, what, Macross what Seven actually gets good. Yeah, what I think is interesting about Macross Seven is that not only does the audience have that reaction, but the entire like the characters in that show have their action. What the hell is Basra doing? What is he? Yeah. What is he doing? And um, before um, we get into that, we we should talk about how. Macross 7 is about this band named Firebomber, and there's some alien known as the, the proto Devlin that are here to steal proto-culture and uh, the culture from people. Um, they're, but, they're here to s steal spirit here. Spirit <laughs> yeah, energy. The culture. Yeah. But anyway, get back, back to seriousness. Like, literally, if the audience and the people on the show is like, what the fuck is Basra doing? And that is going to be your reaction for the first probably couple episodes of what the fuck is is he doing well the funny thing is though the show actually starts to demonstrate that he's on to something yes like the, but, 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 you gotta get you gotta get past those first i don't know six or seven episodes or so like and that seems, sounds like a lot but those first six or seven episodes actually do a lot to establish the characters so it's not like you should just skip them right it establishes no. like you, first we see um max and miria um, from by, the original by, by the way, um, speaking of Max and Maria, um, we all agree, right, that Max is still a Chad and Maria's really rocking the cougar look. Yeah. Yeah. Especially I, when she's in her flight suit, it's like, damn, she ain't missed a step. Yeah, you, you look at her and it's like, oh, she's, like, in her 50s? Wow. Hey, so hey man, woman. Woman. Yeah, exactly. Yes, the trotty women, uh, age slow, more slowly. But, uh, yeah, she, uh, she rocks that flight suit, definitely. Uh, well, but, honestly, uh, Max really rocks, like, the Silver Fox look, too. Like, he's looking damn good for someone in his 50s. Yeah. So, yeah. And, like, the, uh, the number of, like, what's hilarious is, like, Max and Mary have had so many kids by this point. You really don't see half of their progeny. <laughs> Except well, in, like, maybe a photo here or there. Or something like that. You only you only meet like in this you you only meet Mylene really in the in the main show proper. You only meet and Mylene. the OVA. I think we meet another one. That you meet yes. an older sister. Yeah. Yes. To to be fair to the show itself, they never expound upon there being tons of other siblings. Uh, all these siblings have just slowly been invented through later incarnations of Macross. Oh, are you sure? I remember seeing a photograph. Yeah, there's a photograph of one of the OVAs oh. with all the yeah. children. Siblings. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Mylene has a little baby, and it's like, Mylene has a little baby, like, like they have a pair of twins. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah, they have a ton of kids. Um, all right. Uh, seven, so that, I mean, that is canon. canon. 
Yeah, that is canon. Um, so, like, you know, and it's funny because it's like they're all girls. Max did not apparently have any sons whatsoever. <laughs> Although, according to a they... apparently, according to the wiki, there is a manga where the main character is rumored to be, like, the illegitimate son of Max and Miria, but I don't know. That, that... How would he be illegitimate, How... then? I have exactly. no clue. I have no clue. I don't know, maybe like, they just threw, they threw him out? I have no clue. I have no clue. You have dishonored the family. <laughs> Commit Subaku. I don't know. I don't know, but I'll, I'll go find it. But there's like a Macross side story manga about someone who's... I think he's rumored to be the son of um, Max or something. Like some illegitimate yeah. son. I have no idea. Um... I can't read it because ja um, my Japanese isn't that too good. But there's also there's also that, but it didn't make it into the Macross wiki, so it's probably not that important. But, you know, yeah. like, they have a fuck ton of kids. And we meet two of their daughters in the show. Well, you meet one of the daughters in the OVA, but yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so, like, uh, Mylene is the bassist for Firebomber. And then you get um, the old dude who plays, like, backup guitar. I can't remember his name. And Ray, then there's Entrati Ray, chick Ray. on the drums. Ray, Ray that's and it. Ray and Vifidus. Yeah, Vifidus. And then finally there's the lead singer and main guitarist is Basara. And uh, Basara is, he's eccentric. Yeah. And it's funny because they actually get the eccentric musician. Um, what he like, is, fun. Oh, you can continue if you want. Well, yeah, the, the, he is definitely the like if you if you if you're like really in the music and read like the biographies of a lot of musicians and stuff. Uh, st sometimes like genius and insanity go hand in hand. So like you get some of these like really eccentric guys. Like you mean everybody knows Michael Jackson was like super eccentric, but like so was Prince, um, Jimi Hendrix, uh, um, Freddie Mercury to a certain extent. Freddie Mercury, yeah. Um, a lot of these like. Oh, I was actually watching a movie, and... like a little movie about Freddie Mercury, and like, like basically it was like a, it was like a kind of like a documentary or a dramatization a bit about his life, and it's just kind of like, yeah, I, I can see why this. Oh, guy I know became, what movie you're like, talking became, about. Yeah, yeah, became who he became. Like it just kind of makes sense. Yeah, I know what movie you're talking about. So, but like, like yeah, the um, but yeah, the uh, but like Bossa really does kind of like fit that mold of like the the um, he's not a tortured genius, but he definitely is like this eccentric genius who like. He, he he communicates through music. He, and like, you know, if I was to use he a can gray, talk, but um, he prefers to sing. Yeah, I, 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 if I was to use an analogy, he's a fucking Toreador from Vampire the Masquerade. Like he's a diva. He's a prima donna. He he is he is the poster child for the. He's a he is the poster child for that shit. Like he's a rock and roll guitarist. He can sing. He's got so he's yeah. got charisma twenty net twenty. Like he is that personified. Um, but Heraclius, go on. What you're gonna say? Yeah, he, for him, music is basically everything to him. Music is, I think you're right, his way of communicating. His catchphrase, whenever he shows up on the battlefield, is, listen to my song. And it, it, it's, what's also interesting is, you, you call him eccentric, but he, in many ways, he's also very straightforward. For him... Song is everything, music is everything, and authenticity is everything. Anytime yeah. some manager tries to come in and say, Okay, you sing at this time, and we want exactly this feeling and sound in order to cultivate <laughs> things, he just rebels against it, and he can't stand it. Yeah, the, is... the, the natural elite refuses the bureaucratic orders. Yes, yes, and, and that describes him in well, many ways to a T. He he's, is... He's his own person. He is his own man. He doesn't, he, you know, he, he is his own his boss. Yes. And, yeah, I mean, that's the thing is he doesn't do anything he doesn't want to do. No. So what he does is by and large what he wants to do. The the interesting thing about, I think it's interesting about Basra is he kind of is this force of nature. Like, he refuses to be tamed by, you know, the managers or tells them, oh, you can't do that. And he's like, no, it's either I do this or you don't get me at all. Um, and it reminds me of some of the interviews. So I'm, I'm pretty sure Fool's heard of Kiss or, like, I'm, I'm probably, everyone's heard of Kiss. But there were yeah. actually a couple of interviews in the early days where, you know, they were told, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. And basically, I think it's Gene Simmons and um, Paul Stanley, right? Uh, and Paul Stanley basically said to the managers, well, you 
you either get us who we are as we are or you don't get us at all like it, yeah. it's very much that like you know we're popular because of we're popular because we are this way and if you take that away from us like what are we we're just another band and but, but that's but that's the thing about Basra. he's like that even when they're not popular and at the very start of this show they are not popular no they are... <laughs> which, I, which i think says a lot to him as a person like i think it yeah. says a lot about him that he doesn't this is a he's a ver, he's a guy who's unconventional he bucks tradition and he makes it well the funny thing is like they they really do stand in contrast to say somebody like lin min may mm. where she got to where she was because she won a contest which really kind of catapulted her to stardom on the original macross and basara is basically I, a garage band yeah yeah and he, they they do gigs but they got to work their way up to the top and they have yeah. a small group of fans but ultimately they have to work their way there and i, I just want to say they literally are performing uh, what their practice is in this decrepit building that's half destroyed and falling apart falling apart yeah and by the way, throughout like, their fame and the you know throughout their fame, they still live there. By the way, Basra still goes up there. He still lives there. You know, and, and I think that's the thing we we're talking about before. There's something genuine about him. Yes, very much so. And like it, it should be noted that like in the uh, sequel uh, finale, Macross uh, Seven Dynamite, Basra just like fucking books it to random ass planet in the middle of nowhere because that's what he does at yeah. the end of the day he is a wanderer and he wants to not only communicate his song to everyone but he also wants to experience new things and he wants to see everything that the galaxy has i i, I mean leading into that i mean i think like after that like dynamite like fire bomber eventually you know um stops being a band after all because it's like you know we don't have busra here and you know just like we can't have fireball without him so we're, we're just um you know bands on hiatus until he comes back but you know uh, <clears throat> sorry uh, continue but like in macross i think it's macross frontier where they basically reveal it's like oh yeah fire bomber the band's done like they're basically done like because buster is not you know buster is off touring the galaxy you know we'll wait for him when he comes back but until he comes back um you know band's cancelled for now sorry like was was that in uh macross frontier 7 fire bomber or whatever that compilation movie thing was yeah maybe because I, I think they were because the interesting thing about um kind of Bussera as a character is we actually don't really hear anything about him after like macro 7 like it's just completely dead like mm. now granted he's not as big as say like meg may or max is but like this is a dude with a guitar this is a guy who fought off an alien invasion with a fucking guitar and a garage band so you'd think you'd have some sort of level of fame i mean people on random planets recognize who he is yeah, yeah one that, of the things that, 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 that it's kind of interesting thing about buster is we don't really know what happens to him at the end like we assume that you know as far as macross is concerned he's still wandering the galaxy yeah i i think that's almost certainly the case yeah um now i have now when it comes to buster as a character um he's a very um so aside from his intricacies there's a couple of things i have issue with his character um because there's certain skills that he has that for the type of person that he is or like his position in life he should not have why does he have a prototype mech uh why is he a really good martial artist as well mm -hmm. like there's a scene when he's with the the biker chicks or the punks like he like he is in control of that entire situation and i'm like yeah he did this guy get like black ops training from ray or something like that like here's the thing yeah the mech training and maybe the mech i can excuse because you know ray ray's his bro and, and ray hooked him up it's the I other think ray I, said, I think ray straight up says he hooked him up with the um yes the, the valkyrie yes specifically uh, that valkyrie is part of sound force and the reason that uh basara gets the valkyrie to go out is this is sort of like a test bed for sound force yeah and that's the thing is like they hold that back so that it seems like and that's why um um what's his name like during the opening episodes uh, uh gamlin yeah gamlin well that's in the early episodes that's why um um max you know never says get him the hell out of there he always mm -hmm. says leave him alone yes you know it's just like because they, yeah they've been working on this sound force thing for a while you know based on like stuff like min may and things like that you know why not okay give that it, explains it. okay maybe i'm just with him. details in my rewatch but it's yeah like, yeah it's like... yeah episode nine or so uh gomlin uh, tries to look into uh basara and his 
his background and like the computer goes access denied access denied top secret top secret and gamlin goes yeah. what the hell i'll be honest dude like i completely understand why gamlin hates him at first mm -hmm. and it's like you know and it's i also kind of like feel bad for gamlin because it's like he's not a bad dude no well, he isn't you know no he's he not a bad dude Although we are getting like awfully, awfully medieval, yeah. Uh, with with uh, uh, Miria trying to hook Gamlin up with her daughter, who is fourteen <laughs> at the time. Very Japanese. L l it's listen, very medieval. I'm, I'm older than you. I know Japanese, best. Mary Gamlin, please. Uh, I know best. Modern Japanese don't even like try to hook up dudes with grown ass men with fourteen year old girls. Okay, but did they do it in the fifties? I don't know. I don't know. Not today. But I mean, no. it was it's funny because like he. Even into the 1980s, you know, younger girls dating older guys was not seen as predatory as it is today. Mm -hmm. Like, today, they're a lot more like, I guess, we are today. Yeah. Where, like, you know, if a 25-year-old dude is dating a 14-year-old girl, it's like, hello, Chris Hansen, you know, I'd like to report yeah. a, a crime. Uh, um, to, to, to be fair, when Basara is just hanging out with Mylena, uh, they 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 get a, like a couple comments like that. Even though Basara is just hanging out with her because she's yeah. uh, part of the band. Yeah, actually, it's the funny thing is you can tell she's kind of crushing on him. Oh, and, total hot. And, and yeah, and and, and uh, poor Gamlin is just like because Gamlin ends up crushing on her, mm -hmm. and she's basically crushing on Basara. But Basara is all about the music. But yeah, I'd say that he's on the grind set right here, here listen sigma male wall grind set number 15 God. focus on the band not bitches well yeah I'm well, I mean, like, I'm joking, he, but this is like... his, his whole well, that is the thing is like his whole focus is the music. Yes, entirely. You know, he he doesn't have. I, I don't think. I think he's aware of um of uh, Mylene's Mylene. feelings, but he's he's not going to do anything about it because he's just like she. He he she does. Don't, she don't stand a chance because she's not a guitar. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> well, yeah. the, well, I think you're denying the fact that uh, he did have something going on between Civil and him. Yeah, that. That's, well, but, well, okay, yeah, that's different. And also, she is more mature. Yeah, but that that's the main thing. Like, uh, Basara is constantly making these, like, small comments about how Mylena is still a little immature. And, of course, this riles Mylena up the whole time. And the two are constantly bickering at one another. Almost like, uh, I guess you could say... The, Brother and sister, oh, or yeah. like, the, or like the other married couple in this show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, um, we'll, we'll talk about like her later. But I really, I, I, it's I think with Basara, it's not like he doesn't have romantic attachments or anything like that. But no. really, he's the type of guy who is focused because it's not like he doesn't feel that shit. It is, it's not like he doesn't have. He does. Yeah, he does. Like, like, but he's more focused on his music. And as far as my lead is confirmed, like Basara views her as like a little sister. Like that's just who she is. To him. you know. It's oh, not also, erotic. she's a bandmate, right? She's a bandmate me and that's the thing is i don't know just how musically savvy these people are but like you know the impression i saw of... man you know you don't need yoko to break up the band thank you very much no although no, like it, it, you know, like that sort of thing like does kind of produce some great albums i mean have you listened to fleetwood max rumors <laughs> it's an amazing album and it's because everybody was cheating on everybody else during the making of the album but like <laughs> It doesn't, it, you know, it kind of like hurts the longevity of the band after that one album is finished. Um, but the music's great. Mission accomplished. The music itself is great, but like, I mean, going, the, yeah, but going into the band aspect, suffering. going into the band aspect, this, this, I, I don't think they got the drama part. I don't, I don't think there's much drama with the band. But as far as like bands go, like Firebomber does feel like an actual band in some ways. Like you know, you got the archetypes. You know, you got the silent guy, like, the silent person in the corner. You got like the charisma. You go, you got someone who's a bit more empathetic and. You got like the more kind of mature guy yeah you know, because usually when you're in a band you'll have like these archetypes that show off and, you, and you'll see this with interviews you know like red hot chili peppers kiss you know foo fighters or that thing like you're gonna have like these archetypes of people show up um and in terms of how that goes i think firebomber like feels like an actual band in a way yes and, and it is the charisma and, and chemistry between those four characters i guess they could say technically three because the fetus is silent most of the time yeah she speaks but every now it, and then but when she speaks it has 
is meaning like she's the she's yes. the silent one in the band you know she's yeah she's the, the silent bob yeah she yeah you know you know, like you know and during the interviews with fire bomber she's just out in the corner strumming practicing a guitar mm-hmm. staring at the camera you know, during band meetings she'll maybe only say one word she's practicing she's practicing her rudiments yeah or drumming rudiments. Yeah, I was like, I was a drummer in a, in a rock band back in high school. So mm. yeah, yeah. We, I was in a garage band in high school. So Vefidus is uh, or Vefidus, uh, you know, like, she's like practicing on everything. Like I was kind of like that. I'll tell you what, dude. Textbooks are really great drum pads because you oh. get just the right bounce off of them. Oh yeah, I, I actually high, once took drumming. I actually textbook. once took um, drumming lessons. You know, if I ever get enough space in my house, I might just get a full drum kit and like practice. But yeah, but you know, you know, you got the silent character you got like Buster who's a bit of a prima donna you know you got the Mylene who's very bit empathetic you know very much she's like the heart of the band and you got like Ray who's a you know a bit more mature a bit more practical you know a bit more you know a bit more pra- a bit more down to earth um, mm-hmm. but yeah I, I think the chemistry of the band itself is like really good and they do yeah. feel like an actual band one of the things that's very uh that's you can tell is like really the glue of the band is Ray because Ray is the only one who can get Basara to do something kind of against his will. He's the one yeah. who can, he, he's the one who can talk Basara into uh, any sort of gig that he would want to do that Basara is kind of eh, he's kind of iffy about going to but they have a close connection there and he'll he'll put up a fight and he'll mouth off but he'll go along with it and part of that also is the two characters, uh, Ray and Basra, they have a very healthy, I guess you could say, respect for one another's boundaries. Uh, there's one uh, there's one point where Basra has just been going off into the woods doing what, whatever the hell, and it turns out it's like helping to get, he's playing music for this uh, alien yeah. to try and bring her back to life, but none of the other characters know that, and he's certainly not telling them. And only after this has gone, happened like a dozen times or so, does Ray even talk to uh, to him about it, and Ray sort of just nudges him very gently on, on hey, what's going, a little bit about what's going on recently, though even even that is like too aggressively worded for the way he asks uh, Basara, yeah. and and, 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 ba- and Basara just says, "Hey, I'm. I feel like I'm close to finding the reason f- to why why I sing." And he goes, "Oh," and, and Ray understands him perfectly. Yeah, because what I think is interesting about that is like you know that um, we'll talk about civil uh, civvy later and shit because that's going to be an interesting discussion itself. But like he's saying, race, like you know, if you're in a band, right, and one of your glam members is going out in the middle of the night to God knows nowhere, and he does this quite regularly. I mean, you know, as your fellow bandmate, you're gonna be like, "Are you okay, dude? Are you are you alright? Is everything okay?" And he says, "Like, oh, everything's fine." I'm like, "All right, cool, no problem." Um, but yeah, it just kind of showcases how much trust and the there's a lot of companionship with the band too and camaraderie. Like, you know, Ray, all Ray needed to hear is like, Bush was like, "Yeah, I'm fine." And Ray's like, "All right, good, all right, keep out keep out of trouble, good." What what I think is really interesting is that Miley, uh, is it Maylene or Mylene? Mylene. Um, yeah, Mylene. My Lene. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, it's kind of one of the more the newer members country. of the band. She doesn't yes. exactly know those boundaries, and she starts snooping, and um, mm-hmm. interesting stuff oh. happens. Uh, well, yeah, I that's mean... often that's often where, like, the conflict for any episode comes from, is my Lena is, like, jealous of Basra, or doesn't know what he's doing, and she's often snooping around, or she's getting into this or that spat between her and Basra, especially because Basra is, like, like a total pacifist. Uh, yeah. He, he comes at it from, and you can sort of understand from the perspective of the last intergalactic war was stopped by singing. And so Basra takes the strong view that the military can't be trusted and that song communication really is the way of solving these problems. And Mylena really finds that odd. She, especially when the other side tends to attack first, and she she's really sympathetic to the idea of if it's an enemy, just kill it, just destroy it. And Basara is the one who always has that empathy of like he doesn't view the other side as being any different from them. I, and, and and I think this especially comes to the fold when it comes to his little relationship with Civil as well, and the the other um, proto Devlin who the the I forget 
forget his name, but like the um he um yeah uh Gabriel yeah Gabriel oh yeah. Oh, 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 oh giggle giggle yeah, gig- yeah, gig- yeah. Like, they all I, have I really think that starts coming names. to the fro when it comes to that little like relationship they have at some at, at some point. Um, do you guys want to talk about that or should we like put that on the back burner and talk about other stuff? We can move on to that. Okay, we'll move on to that. Um, yeah. So when we talk about how Basra is completely focused, at, like so at at first thought you'd think that Basra you know doesn't feel any like romantic or any kind of attraction to anyone and he's completely up in the music you know he's on the grind set but actually no he isn't he has this very kind of interesting little relationship with um one of the proto devil and i think her name is civil 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 or civil she she is literally a space elf vampire man she's kind of (laughs) cute (laughs) <laughs> I think I think Basra says that in the show. He's like, oh, she's kind of cute. Yeah, and it's around episode 20 or so she's introduced. She's like sort of this floating ball of light that goes around and starts sucking up the energy from people. Because the villains of this show, they're, they're like the proto-Devlin uh, that were like hinted at as being like the longtime adversaries of the Centrati. And they're essentially they're space vampires. They need uh, spiritual energy or spiritia to even survive. Uh, and so this civil woman comes around. She starts being in this like little ball and s- sucks up like the life from all these people and makes them comatose, makes them like unable to move almost kills them and all these other people think of her as this this little moving ball as this huge threat basara sings to her uh to this ball and he sees this woman inside the ball and he starts singing to it and she just freaks out she goes and what can basically only be described i guess as an orgasm she goes completely nuts for his singing and it sort of scares her off the first couple times that this happens. But she comes back because it's like, what is what what is this thing? Because you what know, is yeah, it, it's totally overwhelming for her. They they call him anima spiritia, so, uh, and Civil herself like is is always talking in like this weird lexicon like anima spiritia, spiritia yeah. dreaming. Yeah, it reminds it reminds me of like this entrati language from fucking the you know do and beloved movie. He's like Meltron and, and, and Zeltron, the, the culture. You know, it's, it's a little bit of that little alien language thing, which I really like. You know, it makes them feel um, alien, shit like that. But basically, you know, they, they have their little first meeting, and then she starts kind of stalking him for a bit. <laughs> and she's yeah. so she's absolutely uh, 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 obsessed with this anima yeah. spiritia. Yeah, after previously causing all this trouble and, and getting a lot of people in real danger on the Macra 7 fleet. She then starts sort of like going around uh, stalking uh, Basara and at one point she, while he's singing she just comes up to him and uh, kisses him. And we, we, we should mention that in, during those episodes she's possessing g- people and a couple of women who oh, are yeah, with the pots true. of Basara because um, you know Mylene and this alien aren't the only chicks that like Basara. There's like a biker chick and a flower girl but we can talk about them later but you know uh, you know Buster's kind of got his own little harem fucking growing not that he cares he's all about the fucking rock and roll but continue yeah and after that I wasn't entirely sure plot wise as to why this happens but not long after she kisses him and takes just a little bit of his energy uh, she ends up basically going into a cocoon and almost like going back to sleep essentially and from then on it becomes this running thing thing where Giggle, who so far had been like sort of like the lieutenant of the bad guys, uh, he gets really obs- he apparently has always been like really obsessed with Civil and he really doesn't like the fact that she's gone to sleep and so he starts like trying to round up spiritier energy from people all over the fleet in order to uh, get her back awake and meanwhile Basra happens upon her in the forest as well and he starts singing to her and he, uh, hoping that somehow his singing is going to uh, awaken her despite knowing the fact that that she is an enemy. She has caused, uh, I don't know how many deaths, but a lot of near deaths to a lot of members of the Macra 7 fleet. And he is singing to her to try and bring her back away. And, and that sort of becomes a running plot for like something like five episodes or so, or something like that. Yeah. And, and, that's an, and that's another example of Basra sort of bucking the system, because every other character... Th- 
sees these proto devlin as essentially pure evil and not capable of being reasoned with and and that gets him into like some contrast between him and the military who of course just want to like experiment on civil and do whatever the hell to her and basically turn her into a science experiment yeah and and, and Basra is not like that and you get the impression their little relationship it isn't just like you know he wants her to hear a song like you get the impression I mean this is kind of like the impression that I got but he's I trying to reach her yeah trying to reach her like that you get the like it's it's more than just listen to my song she he's trying to reach understanding with her and I kind of feel that there's a little bit of a bond developing there for that um and there's a really interesting episode kind of like around the ending where you know like she almost kills him by accident like almost like yes. almost kills him yes and she's horrified and she like she's horrified and she tries to stay away from him because he's like oh my god I've this person who's done all these things for me tried to help me I almost mm-hmm. killed him and um I kind of love the part in the end you know they work together to bring down the big bad and then you know the the proto devil are leaving back to their home planet and shit and you see her like you see her and Basra meet each other right again and there's almost like that you see like almost like this conflict in her head that she wants to stay with Basra but at the same time she wants to go back for her own people as well you, mm-hmm. you, you kind of get this kind of like star-crossed lovers type of vibe to it yeah and she ultimately uh, go, uh, goes back with them uh, and, and says goodbye to Basra then yeah and I, and I like how Basra is just like you know they have this bond and things but he's not gonna hold it against her he's like you know you go if you, you, you go be free uh but mm. you know I, I i thought it was kind of adorable and sweet <laughs> i just saw that oh that's good I'm, I'm, I'm saving uh i'm i might have that as a picture that goes on the background because that's just great <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny yeah well, but i you, do want to point i do want to kind of point out that the, the whole proto devil thing is interesting because one of the things that macross has always played with is the whole chariots of the gods idea and the panspermia concept where it's like um uh sentient life uh was seated on the earth it's like some kind of sort of thing that pops up sort of in uh kind of sort of in 2001 a space odyssey but it pops up in like you no know, graham hancock's uh fingerprints of the gods uh, uh stuff and all this other weird shit you know ancient aliens type shit and um you know it's the kind of stuff you see on the not so history channel and uh well you used to yeah wow well, yeah you used to yeah you can't have fun um, anymore no you're not allowed to have fun fun is banned yeah, one is banned permanently. But um, yeah, the uh, that that kind of stuff, right? And uh, the Macros has always kind of played with that concept, uh, because like, what is protoculture? Well, it turns out protoculture steeded life on the Earth, um, and that's you know that's kind of like where Earth, where where humanity comes from is like they were you know we were we are the product of protoculture depositing uh life on this planet and you know so the proto devlin are this ancient race that the protoculture originally encountered and they- so it's like well that means that their myths or their their history was kind of transmitted to us in the form of myths and that's like this is where we get the you know our ideas of vampires and, and demons yeah. and things like that and, and kinda- the- and the thing is, the proto devlin were basically the threat to all other life forms because they needed this spirit here in order to survive. So they, what they do is they just go around from species to species, sucking around all their, uh, all, all their life energy. And I think it's basically implied that at a certain point they almost succeeded in sucking nearly everything and at this point they just basically froze themselves and put themselves into suspended animation because they didn't have enough energy uh to keep themselves going and uh they were actually like rediscovered by like a random macross fleet that just was going through some ice and was unfortunate enough to rediscover and awaken them yeah yeah and yeah, that, and, uh, you know, it makes me wonder that this was this what happened to like the the second macross you know that um mid-may and shit went on like no that did not happen to them they're all living happily ever after somewhere in the center (laughs) of the galaxy okay okay science denier um but it's it's just like you know it it gives this impression of like you know the galaxy is a big place and you you know you don't know what the fuck is out there i mean you've met the zentrata yeah and you know the meltron and zeltron and shit but god knows what else is out there and what also helps yeah and what also helps 
that is that there's multiple like planets with all sorts of alien creatures on on top of it and most of them are like weird dinosaur things you also see more in the macross uh seven dynamite where you have like literal space whales and they don't look exactly like oh uh, yeah you know? and the marsupial people fuck you whale yeah, yeah. fuck you whale i'm like that is actually kind of rad that there's like the marsupial people species oh yeah those are kind like, of cool it, like so like that actually really 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 does open the universe up it's like macross 7 kind of does more to open the universe up than like plus or um uh, yeah because or, like or, yeah, or, or, uh, frontier yeah because it's, yeah it's any much, other map plus i yeah, can because as, as much as i may complain a little bit about some of the filler episodes i must admit the world building in the show is actually quite great and it does help some of the episode i i, I mean i say filler but that's what the car feels like it does actually help flesh out the world a bit more and also flesh out a bit more of the characters yo um, well, i mean more of the characters so i guess it's good for that i mean every episode in this show is filler from a certain point of view every episode nearly i mean there are a few episodes that are more plot related in terms of an overarching plot but nearly every episode is about this is the daily struggles for the fire bomber squad and this is how they're going to react to it and go through it it's very uh, sitcom-esque almost and, and sort of like a sitcom, you you keep watching, uh, not necessarily because you absolutely have to see what happens next, but because you enjoy that cast of characters and you want to s- uh, and you want to see them each week. Yeah, and it it does have a good cast of characters, and it's it is. I'll be honest, it is nice to see characters from the original Macross older and seeing how they developed. I mean, it kind of sucks that Max and Miria split, but it does introduce an interesting dimension, and yeah, I- it's it's obvious that they, st- especially if you watch the OVAs and stuff, it's obvious that they still they, they, they still, still have each feelings other. for each other. Oh yeah, yeah the they, spark they still is still do. there. Hasn't died. Uh, see, and then, see, yeah, the, uh, Mel- the, Mel- the Meltron the episode is, see, is just. See, I kept waiting for those two to uh, end up back together by the end of the series because they never have like formally divorced. Uh, but no, it doesn't happen. Well, like I said, the closest you're going to get is the Meltron the episode. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, the the well, um. One thing that's sort of an interesting dynamic there is Miria is like the head of the civilian government on Macross Seven and Mac is the head of the military. Yeah. And so Miria is like in this constant adversarial relationship with Max where she seems to feel like she has to be constantly making demands of the military. What are you doing? Why didn't you do X, Y, Z? And she actually does this outside of like her official post. And Max is just sort of like the exhausted guy there who's like, who's just trying to deal with this crazy woman that's trying to start a fight with him every time they talk yeah well it's funny because they they have the um like uh the one uh the one um whenever they're on the news together it's just like the um the Uh. news anchor is always just like kind of like wow you guys get along uh uh, about as well as a a divorced couple so when's the divorce and then it's like fuck off (laughs) <laughs> you, you get the like, impression that like you know they still love each other and this is just their way of like fucking showing affection like how, how well, dare you bitch it's, it's more like, it's oh, you more like you mo- it's more like I, I, it's more like the vagaries of life and like the the frustrations of reality have yeah. it, have gotten in the way and it's like it's like you know how many people i've known who've gotten divorced because of money oh, right and i'm not yeah. talking like you know she takes him for all he's worth no i'm talking like they just the money gets tight and they can't work it out and so they end up getting divorced because they can't work out their financial situation together they can do you know, so and alone so in like max and maria's case i mean you know, max isn't a young man anymore like he isn't maria they aren't yeah. young anymore They're like in their 50s like you know max is at this point you know they're gonna be like grandparents soon and um yeah you know he's not a young buck anymore like he just can't do this and you, you kind of he, he does kind of portray like he's still got it but there's like this little bit of this tiredness where he's just like yeah i'm not as young as they used to well there's yeah. a hilarious scene one of my favorite scenes of the entire show is when um mylene comes on the bridge and drags him off the bridge Papa. and like and, and it's like she drags him off and like the bridge bunnies the girls on the bridge are like oh my god she's like a quarter of his age he should be ashamed of himself and it actually is just like 
like, that's his daughter. And they're like, oh, 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 oh. Because this was about to be like some serious scandalous gossip among the girls on the oh, bridge. Oh, did you, did you and see what the captain just like Exidor just like fucking slams the door on us. It's like, she's his daughter. It's like, oh, oh, like for real his daughter. It's like, boom, no. I love that scene, dude. I thought that was hysterical, Oh, that's man. just yeah, funny as shit. Yeah, yeah, Mylena was also like uh, dressed up in like the most ridiculously cool over-the-top kind of slutty clothing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, pool girl, you might say. Yeah, Well, that's yeah, just kind dude. of what I thought to myself, is like, cool girl. Like, that's the first thing that popped my head on that scene. Oh, girl, or... Cool or, girl, yeah, no, cool girl. Cool. Oh, cool. okay. Cool, like, you phone call, oh, and a girl. Oh, call girl. Cool okay. girl, cool yeah, it's the, girl. Cool it's, girl. It's, it's, it's the accent, dude. I say call, call. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't born in the United States of America. Well, no, I mean, you were born in the Northeast, you know? It's like call, girl, coffee, blog. Coffee. I saw it. I saw it. You know? No, see, you put an R on there. You saw it. I saw it. You saw it, and you're from, like, Boston or some shit like that. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, it's fun little linguistic cheat But anyway, continue on with that scene. Um, the, like, no, it's just, that's, that's like the end of the scene. Like, they're about to start gossiping the, the, the living daylights out of it. And then Exidor is just like, no, she's his daughter. It's like, yeah, and, and, and then there's, boom. like, Macro 7 Encore. Uh, o- OVA where like it's all set up because uh, Miria because she has a minor cold she of course thinks that she's going to die at any moment of course yeah midlife crisis yeah. <laughs> midlife crisis and so she immediately like Calls Wait, you mean she got COVID-19? Yes, yes, she did. You thought she was going to die? Yeah, she got, like, the NIS-X virus, or whatever yeah, they right. called it. And she calls up Miria, and she goes, Hey, you want- I want you to get married. Why don't you get married to, to Basa right now? And Mylena goes, Huh? Uh, especially because we haven't got to this yet, but it's previously it, it had been uh, Miria who had set up Mylene with uh, Gamlin for mm-hmm. a marriage, and now after like forty episode 45 episodes or so and their relationship is actually stable and fun and then all of a sudden Miri goes well, why don't you just marry Basara you, you see Gamlin's like too serious he's just like Max it'll never do <laughs> and Mylene is just sort of like one ang- angry at the idea of her, like deciding such things and angry at the idea of <laughs> marrying immediately and all this other stuff and the other thing is is like you know wow you sure change your tune overnight like because he was all against that shit mm-hmm. in the beginning of the show. Oh yeah, and then it's like later as time goes on. Yeah, she's like Asian, <laughs> like she's like Asian grandpa. I want grandchild, grandchild now. Grandchild. Yes, very much. What, what, like, did like, did her expose to humanity? How many grandkids do you have already? Grandchild now. How many grandkids do you have already? Is like I would want to more, ask. More, because, more, like, more grandchild. More grandchild. Because <laughs> you know, you, you, you actually what they have a daughter or granddaughter who's in. The the one I don't want to see because it's Macross looks, Delta. Yeah, that looks corny. I yeah, hate to say it. It, it's not it's like great. the only thing that makes me want to watch it is the fact that it's Max's granddaughter in this one, and it's like yeah, Ma- Max it, Mir's granddaughter. It's like yeah, she's probably gonna be probably badass. Yeah, she is the tsundere that like has no chance in the Wait, in no. the love triangle and is just <sighs> a constant third wheel and is suffering. Are you serious? Yes. That's what they do to her. Yes. Oh man. I, I, I guess the Chad genes can only go so far. Um, I guess it skips a generation or two. Um, I'm um, going. Uh, fuck. What else to talk about? Uh, we'll talk about the pro Devlin. Um, I, I guess it's one of the top got Max and Mary in the relationship. Let's talk a little bit about Mylene as a character. Um, Ma. Yeah, it's Mylene. Mylene. Yeah, Mylene. Uh, let's talk about, about her as a character. Um, at the big, be- I kind of now I don't hate her, but I found her kind of annoying. She had a little bit of that, like to me. She kind of had that bit of the um kind of brat younger sibling who's trying to act all mature but as a like, yes that's, that's kind of the vibe i got from her she did get better at the end but like that, it's just like it bowled me one time like the one scene that kind of stood out to me is you know during the scene when bus was rocking out the civil you know the holy night me to i forget the rest of the lyrics and she's like in the background she's talking to ray it's like ray why can't i be in sound force i want to be a badass mecha pilot too mum and dad won't let me Blah. like that's kind of like the one scene that kind of brought that up and what i love about that scene is you you see her 
her like eyes going down but she's looking up like looking up at him trying to do like little cutesy pouncy oh please feel bad for me look like you, mm-hmm. you know that look of where yes yes and I'm like oh uh, you fuck the puppy dog eyes yeah yeah she's like oh please feel bad for- take me seriously but it'll also feel bad for me yeah that fucking look I'm like oh god oh I hate I don't like that look but it's just like um aside from that I fought her relationship with um Gu- is it Goblin or what um Goblin Gam- Gamlin 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 um I thought that was quite cute I, I thought it was quite cute and I was just like oh uh, you know she gotta get over Basra and um you know hook up with him because honestly I think that'd be a good match together can I can I just can I just point out like about Mylene is that her her voice actress was Chie um um what the hell's her name Ka- Kajiura I think Chie Kajiura and uh, that that was specifically her uh singing, singing voice? yeah, yeah. And it's uh Tomo Sakurai for the oh, okay so it is a different yeah, yeah. voice actor for the okay yeah you can tell okay well the funny thing is like her singing uh there's a handful of her, so like only like 10 or 12 episodes where the ending uh is uh her uh, Chie Ka- Ka- uh, Kajiura's uh, song Dakero Baby uh, done with to make it sound like it's Mylene or whatever I don't think she ever actually sings it during the show but it is the ending song the ending theme song and if you listen to it it really 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 sounds like late 60s Brit pop like mid to late 60s Brit pop insanely it's like it sounds almost like something off of Sgt. Pepper's or another Beatles album like it's the people I, I gotta say like the people who did the music for this knew their rock history History, they knew the rock and roll. They understood it because what was really big in the late 80s when Macro 7 was coming out, late 80s, early 90s, hair metal, at least in Japan. Like, hair metal was... It, it took a couple years for hair metal to hit Japan, but when it finally did, they, they were a couple years behind us in that regard. Um, yeah, but music like, trends in Japan are actually quite is, interesting. Like, in some ways, they're a bit behind, and in some ways, they're, like, ahead of the curve. They're ahead ways. of us, yeah. It is interesting like that. I mean, have <laughs> you listened like, to yeah. the Japanese rap? I mean, some of that it is pretty fucking good it is it but that's the thing is like some of these songs that like you know that start like the the, that fire bomber plays it's like the guitar riff comes in and then you hear him go "Ah," like you know total like hair metal freaking motley crew kiss uh like that kind of like def leopard era of like hair metal it's almost like you know you like just he, he just like does the whole screech thing man and it's like top of his lungs I'm like, dude, that's awesome. Oh, this is Bassar, like you ready mean? to go, man. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, this is like, yo, Bossa is ready to go. This is going oh, yeah. to rock out, dude. Yeah, w- one of the uh, running things that comes up is the idea, uh, eventually the music like literally becomes weaponized, where like as the big proto devlins yeah. start coming out, conventional weapons bigger, are bigger. just, they get bigger and bigger. They become these giant monsters that even nukes do fucking nothing to. And the only weapon against they have against them is song and yeah. it becomes like this whole thing of they have to sing louder you have to sing more passionately uh i almost wonder you gotta get <laughs> you ever, i wonder you ever, you if this, seen... i wonder if this show was like an inspiration for symphony or something because they sort of did like uh, a similar thing of that have you ever seen this is spinal tap no no is it, a... this show is it this show is it there's a scene in this is spinal tap where they have um they because the, i don't this is spinal tap is like a mock documentary of a uh, fake British uh, uh, hair metal band mm-hmm. and there's a scene where they're sitting and they're, they're, they have their, their their amps and everything and they're talking about how you know, Oz are better because they go up to 11 and the guy the, the, the documentarian is like well why don't you just make 11 the next 10 like I don't get it like but then they wouldn't go up to 11 <laughs> uh, you see Oz go up to 11 so they're louder it's like well why don't you just make 11 10 dude and just like have that like but yeah but it wouldn't be 11 like that's the mechs in macross when they're playing is like they have to go up to 11 to yes. be able to defeat the proto yeah very much so <laughs> Oh, uh, but since, hey. since um, sorry, I had to take a quick piss. But like, since since we're talking about the music, can I just say that like the music in the show is fucking great. Like, um, mm-hmm. what, what were you? Because I've got a few favorites. I liked. Um, I was like, the, the Lo- lamest Lo- song. The lamest song is the one that they play in the first episodes. Yes, that's like the, the one. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I, oh, I, yeah, I still, it's Saturday I still night. Like, oh, it. like that one. Yeah, it's okay, but it's actually like yeah. the lamest one. Yeah. 
Like the yeah. Um, so the our favourites of- was um, Power to the Universe, um, Holy Lonely yeah. Night, and the opening was my favourite of the tracks. Because like, here's the thing: like, we're not saying that the first op- um, like song in the like the first episode is bad. It's just you know, it's a, it's a it's a six out of ten in an album that's like seven and eight. It's like it's not a bad song. It's just you know, it's just like oh, the song's playing. It's not bad, but there's better shit. There's better tracks. I mean, for for bands like early day shit, it's not too bad. I mean, if you look at some of the early day shit that some bands came out with, it's like, what the fuck were you thinking? Yeah, Power to the Dream especially, it helps that it's played in this wonderful like, arc of episodes where Basara, civil like, uh goes off to, like, some volcano place, and she's again gone back into stasis, and uh, and basically because of this, uh, Basu has almost, like, lost his voice, he can't really sing, and he's, like, searching for her to try and, like, get back to the way things were, and then when he comes upon her, he struggles to start singing for quite a bit, even as she starts, like, moving down into this volcano, and then there's this climactic scene where even as she's falling in, uh, like, slowly floating down because she's in a ball of energy. He finally gets, like, the courage and, and, like, his voice comes back and he starts singing Power to the Dream for the first time. And it's just this excellent scene. And then, like... Giggle, the guy who was like all about saving civil, he starts singing along too, and like, <laughs> even though he's a, as like a terrible voice for the matter, you can hear the, you can understand and feel the passion in him too, and it's it's a fantastic scene. Yeah, can I, like I, I honestly just want to say that so, sometimes the music kicks in, like it just does great for these fucking scenes. You know, when he plays like ho- I think it's called Holy Lonely Night for the first time when he's confronting civil, he's like, "You'll listen to my song." <laughs> Like that fucking, I'm like, like it gets you pumped and shit. And it's like, you know, he's got energy powering as he's like powering up the, the amateur spirit show. Like this show is really good for setting the scene and getting you pumped. Um, Absolutely. And an interesting and, and fun fact about the music is that the person who does, I think he plays Basra. And this is one of the reasons why the show will never get English dub um, for better or for worse. But um, I guess for better in this one. case. Uh, it's better in this case. Is there's a lot it did of, get like, one dude back in the 80s or like late 80s, early 90s. Macro 7 came out 90s, bruh. Or uh, wait, yeah, I remember it on VHS. It got a dub. Was that like a Singapore dub or something? No, this was like a legit. I don't remember who. Hold on. I, I, no, I swear to God, I couldn't find an English double. Who shit. dubbed Macross 7 in the 90s? Yeah, because I read somewhere that they couldn't do uh, it dubbed because it's all like legal finagling because the actual no. the actual band Fire Bomber is actually played by an actual Japanese band. And there's a bunch of like it legal is, copyright but, shit. Yeah. Dude, they really did not give that much of a shit back then. I mean, it wasn't. You gotta remember, anime wasn't huge back then. Oh, come on, come on, you gotta tell me who. who... Yeah, they, thanks to it being huge now, now you can't even get Fly Me to the Moon on fucking Evangelion. I know. Horrible. Horrible. Go figure, dude. All right, hold on. Let's try Wikipedia. Because I, I swear to God, I read somewhere that there was a double of this for legal bullshit reasons. I don't know. No, dude, there totally was. I remember very vividly seeing the VHSs. Mac- much of the Macross merchandise, including Macross 7, have not received an international release. That's impossible. I remember seeing Macross 7. I remember seeing it. Like, I wouldn't be surprised... Unless I'm misremembering something severely. I'm almost positive. I mean, it wouldn't shock me if you were just getting, like, bootleg uh, VHSs in. No, it wasn't. Time. These these had a sleeve and everything. Hold on. <sighs> I, I mean, they could have made the sleeves. It's not that hard if you have the technology. I, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, I've, I've come across, like, some bootleg shit that looks great. Like, I didn't buy it, but, like, you know, I've seen stuff like that before. I'm almost positive I saw Mac- Macross 7 at Suncoast video back in the day. Well, it, it, but This is gonna way, drive um, me nuts now, man. This is gonna drive me nuts. <laughs> I know I saw that shit. I I'm sorry how, I brought it up. Podcast, Fools is gonna be up all night, like, he's just trying running calculus, like, Why? Okay. I know I fucking saw it somewhere. Uh, younger brother, did I see Suncoast videos about the Japanimation? I actually, you know, my brother might remember. I don't know. Please. I know I saw Macross Plus. Okay, like, uh, no. No, like this was like legit it had like a starry blue background and it said macross and it had the seven in the same logo almost positive man 
Full I don't know. I'm going to have to look this up. Yeah, that's fine. We can look this up. <laughs> but yeah, like, the music in the show, later. It, it fucking, it, it's great. Especially if you like, like, rock and roll and shit. Um, also, that guitar shit that he sings, the Basra sings in the forest. I, I need to find that song, but that's great too. Yeah, but the music in this is fucking great. Oh, um. I, I'll, I'll say as far as, like, compared to other Macross, not only does this have a greater musical component, at the same time, there's a little bit of it, but there's almost no emphasis, almost none, on the idol element. Like, yeah, that, that's just, that is kind of interesting, because, like, you know, there, th- this is more rock band shit, and here's the thing, like, idols were a big thing in, you know, early, like, 90s, 2000s. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, yeah, they're, at- they're still a big thing now, but as far as, like, cultural significance goes, I mean, idols, like, especially, like, the lone idol or the idol group, like, that shit was getting popular mm-hmm. when, around when Macross 7 was out. So, it, it is actually quite interesting how it focuses more on, like, a rock and roll type shit than, like, say, idols, because that's what, because, like, other Macross shows has their idol elements out. Oh, fuck, even the Macross shows after this have idols, but this show oh, decided yeah. to go with more rock and roll shit. Yeah, to be honest, I enjoyed it. Uh, I guess it wouldn't feel entirely appropriate with with someone like Basra, who's like, whose entire like worldview is is uh, screw the system. Like that that is like a pure 180 of what an idol is supposed to do. And Mylena t- too, uh, she also has quite a bit of attitude and, and uh, feisty, bratty, sort of that type of personality. Uh, she she wouldn't exactly be a model idol either. No, because what little bits I know about the the Japanese idol industry, which isn't much. Um, uh, the, the stuff stuff i've heard about that industry is kind of fucked um yeah there's no there's no really one way to describe it um like i've i've like i don't really I'm, I'm not like super big into idol groups and shit like that like i like some of their music but for the mo- like most part not really my thing but um yeah it's, it's kind of interesting about macross here what makes it kind of different i guess is the black sheep is it's side to focus on like an actual kind of like rock band um and these dudes do feel like a rock band like they definitely capture that kind of like and they're not in your face like a like a punk band would be but they kind of have that this is who we are attitude and you know deal with it or get out attitude yes exactly and that's one of the things that uh as we said it makes them grow very very slowly over the course of the series and there's like producers that try and like wrangle them as they want uh but eventually they get a pretty decent producer akiko and part of the reason is like she's friends and uh former love interest of uh way going way back yeah apparently at the end you see a bit of a rekindling there but yeah she's actually quite an interesting character she's just like yeah that that doesn't surprise me there's this really sweet scene between them like episode 22 well where Ray's just sort of doing something and, and she starts flirting with him and like uh exposing her cleavage or widow is like is that all is that all there's a really there's a lot of scenes like that where it's done with like a certain level of subtlety and naturalness that's yeah, like that, that, that's common like, um... to 90s anime and you won't see today very often yeah that, that, that is kind of an interesting thing in macross and i mentioned this in macross plus where like in macross plus, macross plus there was kind of like this erotic kind of cameraman angle shit here um and i think you mentioned this before too with some of the the a bit of the fetishy stuff is that there, there definitely is a little bit of that kind of natural seductive sexual element in the show going on a little bit which mm. I, I mean you get that a little bit with quite a few shows from the 90s and, and some shows the 90s and going forward they're a bit more explicit about this more explicit about it for a bit more explicit about it but like in, in this show it is kind of like a little bit of a nudge nudge like wink wink nudge nudge to the audience a little bit like especially with like you know the biker girl like you kind of see a bit of her like her cleavage in the suit um yeah you know with, with, Sybil, uh, they're, with they're... the animature spirit to you shit yeah with, with the biker girl one of the neat things they do is there's like a whole episode where she like doesn't really respect uh basara uh and, and thinks he's just like almost uh, preying on mylena and then whole episodes goes by basara shows that he can bike almost as well as they can uh and, and he saves their lives using his valkyrie uh the first and only time he's actually forced to use the conventional weaponry on the thing uh, yeah, because the, uh, the interesting thing about Basra is that even though he is a pacifist, if he has to use violence, he will. Like, yeah, but he does. Reg- I guess, yeah, but he does. But he does that in the moment, and he's cursing himself for having to do that. Yeah, I like. Yeah, I'll add the thing is that he regretfully has to do it. 
if he like he would prefer not to do it but if he has to do it like he doesn't want to do it and he won't like it afterwards but if he has to he will which is kind of an interesting thing it's you know there's a bit of wiggle room there but this, it's like by the way i absolutely love the biker chick because you know i have a bit of a soft yeah, spot rex. for like the fuck yeah rex she's great i have a bit of a soft spot for the delinquent fucking delinquent girl archetype in japan i kind of it's just like man why can't i date this it's just like no mm-hmm. yeah well what's what's especially neat in the way they set that up is at the end of that episode you've never seen all you see is this biker and you know she's a woman because of her voice but there's like no other distinguishing features she keeps her helmet on the whole time and then finally at the end after she uh after she's been saved uh he he go basra sort of goes to like hey did you so my song get through to you a little she goes uh, sort of like yeah a little Uh, and she takes off her helmet and all of a sudden you see this gorgeous blonde uh, with this long hair step out and uh, and then she just kisses him uh, and basically says that as a reward and then drives away it's a nice scene and like just great you know it doesn't you know gives him a sense of dramatic no elaboration just go drives off yeah and she becomes a recurring character after that that's like episode five but she becomes a infrequently recurring character and sort of like someone whenever they want uh she can come back around and become part of the main cast like whenever they like fire bomber needs to rely on some other people uh she'll come around and yeah uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to say she's like a groupie but she's almost like in some ways like a pseudo band staff member in a way like she's not she's not in the band but she's like yeah you can hang out with us in the tour truck you know get some beers and have some burgers you know you know she's one of the uh not the groupie uh what's the word i think the term is like roadie or something like that like she's kind of like a roadie you know hang out with the band um, uh now, n- now i'm thinking of uh uh, different people but uh that's neither here nor well, there she, yeah i don't well she's well i don't know what the term is it's not a groupie I, like roadie's like the closest thing i think to it because i know these like people that travel with the band hey hey fool um you um for what is it what are the people that like travel with the band and like hang out with them and roadies, they roadies or groupies oh okay. roadies groupies fuck them roadies help them yeah like i kind of feel that um Matt, rex and a little gang they're kind of like little roadies for for fire bomber yeah, I, I actually, um, talking about some of the other side characters, we kind of talked a little bit about V. Um, there's not much really going on with V. Um, oh. Ray has a few interesting things going on uh, with his backstory and his relationship with Basra. Um, I do want to point out, like, if you consider the mechs themselves side characters, all the mechs that were being tested in, um, Macross, uh, Plus. Macross Plus all pop up in this. Yes. Yeah. Like, I think it's awesome. Yeah, it, it is. And they were coming out at, like, the exact same time. I think there were even now I saw in like what the torrent I downloaded uh it says like Macross 7 plus 3 and then plus 4 I'm assuming these are like little shorts yes. that were included with every episode of the Macross plus OVA uh I have them Scott. yeah I, well I don't know if they were I don't, I don't remember if, I, I don't know if they were included with the English release I have no idea I mean you might be right I might be misremembering things though when it comes to like whether or not it was released i, I have a very I, strong memory of that though but I mean, yeah. man, look, look for in your defense it was like almost like 20 years ago and you also are running low on more time, than so, 20 so. years ago no no like, that's 25 yeah, 25 yeah you're, you're running low on boomer juice and anyway <laughs> um diet monster. oh yeah i only have one macross plus uh short and it's about two and a half minutes long that's it mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. Um, so we've talked about the music. Um, I feel the animation in this was fine, like for the most part. Um, yeah, one of the things that people talk about that uh, criticize this, and it's a fair criticism. There's a lot of stock. Oh fuck you! The, yes. ac- the actual uh, animation of most of the fight scenes is boring as all hell. Oh, yeah. It, like, yeah. I mean... Com- it, like, here's the thing. It's not as bad as some episodes of, like, the original Macross, but, you know... You know, that stock anime... I'm not really the biggest fan of stock animation. That was animation. dated. Yeah, it... it I mean, like, honestly, yeah. like... That 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 has an excuse. I mean, well, when I go back and I watch any mecha anime, f- with the exception of like Votoms, really, like mm-hmm. if I go back and watch any mecha anime from like the eighties, and like I really don't find the combat scenes to be really all that good, except for little moments here and there where the Sakuga gets really high. But yeah, 
you know, the, with the exception of those couple moments, by and large, like, yeah, the, the combat scenes are, I don't like the least interesting part. They didn't age well. Yeah, very much the case with Macross. Uh, well, no, well, with Macross 7 in particular. I feel like it's also a thing with, like, uh, Tomino in Gundam. I don't think he's ever gotten, like, a good handle, in my opinion, of, like, directing action. It's, like, competent, but I've... I can almost count on one hand the amount of uh, action scenes that I remember as being particularly good from a, like, a Tomino Gundam show. And I think nearly all of them would come from Tone A, and they were very short. Yeah. Mm. Um, so before we continue, um, there's any more topics you guys want to bring up before we go, um, oh yeah, we forgot to talk about the Proto Devlin, a little bit more about the Proto Devlin shit, but, um, bef- um, aside from that, any, uh, further topics you guys want to talk about before we kind of wrap this up? Because I kind of feel we've talked to, I, I kind of feel the, the conversation is, uh, reaching its end of its rope, so, um, any further topics anyone wants to bring up before we kind of start, uh, wrapping this up? Um, I don't know, like, I, we, I'd like to, I'd like to, 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 oh, go ahead. We haven't like talked to, a lot about Gamlin, that's all I was going to say. Well, yeah, I mean, what is there to say about him? I mean, like, he... Yeah, he's sort he, of like the serious dude. He's he, not really well-developed. No, he he's likable, but he's just sort of always there. And he's the he's the he's serious the fighter Basra. pilot dude. He's, he's Basra's foil, yes. He only starts to, like... I think, I think the turning point, at which point he really starts to respect Basra, is the episode where they have to save the whole fleet from going into the sun oh yeah that was like great. yeah and, and like and it's totally absurd the setup of how they even got to that point but the episode itself is great and uh Gam- yeah and and they have to like put some tubes together and whatnot and basra shows some real skill uh and after that uh gomlin who starts off being like very antagonistic to basra really doesn't like him he, he's the one who starts going, saying to Mylena, well, he, he's got some positive qualities, he's got some real skill, yeah. and he, he understands where he's coming from. And I think the first time he's, he talks like that, Mylena almost, like, freaks out and goes, what? Is what this have you, you done with Goblin? What have you done? Are you a proto different spy? <laughs> yeah. Why are you Not talk- quite that. Not quite that extreme, but yeah. What 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 I find interesting from more of a structural standpoint of the show uh, is this is the last Macross that really feels like it's not retreading the same old ground as the original. And granted, I I haven't seen Delta, so I really can't comment on that. But in a lot of ways, it, you know, when you watch Frontier, it kind of is retreading some of the same ground the original did. And when you watch uh, uh um. It's the one that takes place, the prequel one. Zero. When you watch Macross Zero, mm-hmm. that one really is kind of a... It's a prequel, mm-hmm. so it it's setting up the original series in a lot of ways. Um, Macross 7 kind of really does its own thing. I mean, it has similar things that all the Macross shows have. It has, like, uh, love, music, love and triangles, war. Love triangles, the kind protoculture. Of and, and, and one of the keys, you know, this idea of understanding and love being and able to... Yeah, and, like, being able to overcome things. But it's it tries things, though, at the same time that are... That kind of call that a bit into question, like Max and Miria's uh, relationship being on the rocks, right? It's like, well, can love conquer all? Right, and it, it kind of does call that into question, and you know because you have all these outside influences that are causing or or sort of exacerbating the split between Max and Maria, and but that's the thing is that this show is is trying things. It's it's not structured like the original Macross. Um, no, yeah, me, it's, me it's, and Heraculus talked a little bit about this earlier before, but uh, out of all the other Macross shows, this show went for a more rock and roll type show. All the other shows, ex- excluding this one, all went for idols. This one went for rock and roll. And I, and I think that's what yeah. makes Macross see in a very special way, is that it is very rock and roll. I was talking about this earlier. It does. Like, yeah. it, it, it's very, it has this attitude of, you know, this is who we are, either accept it or get out. Like, it has that very rock and roll attitude to it. Like, it isn't in your face like punk, but it's very much like, it, like it'll get out. Like, it's very, like, that is what Macross 7 is. And I think that's partially why a lot of people, why this is the black sheep of Macross, because all the rest is idle shit, and, and this is not idle shit. It's the opposite. It's and, also, and also on top of that, there's the other uh, set of the Macross fandom, which is like, we just want mechs 
fighting and serious space opera and serious plot and, and drama and drama in terms of like military war drama and that is not this and it is unapologetic about the fact that well you're gonna have like a tiny some el- some elements of that but for the most part that stuff is on the back burner and, well, and- yeah the only real military war drama uh was the original Macross and yeah. the and and Frontier I guess as well but that's because Frontier is kind of riffing off of the original in ways that 7 isn't um like 7 actually like 7 is borderline like my favorite so far like I don't know like it's a real toss I really have a strong place in my heart for the original because I grew up watching it Mm. as a kid uh, in the form of Robotech Um, I really love DYRL and phenomenal movie oh god it it, it makes no sense if you haven't watched the show but if you have watched the original show it's it's beautiful that ending uh, like the 8 minutes where Min Mei sings uh, do you remember love? Uh, oh, and, and they destroy. It, it, yeah, it, that is some of the best animation. Some one of the best yeah. anime scenes ever. And, and it's that. I mean, dude, that actually like. I I know I'm talking a little bit about something other than Macro Seven, but That's like that catapults like content. that that cat. Yeah, okay, that catapults the end of Frontier for me when she starts singing. Uh, Ironka starts singing. Do you remember love? Like holy sh. Yet, dude, mm-hmm. like yeah. my heart, like my heart just like ripped itself in half in that scene. Like, mm-hmm. oh damn! And and I don't, I don't remember Veronica's voice actor, but, actress, but she fucking yeah. kills it. Megumi and, and, oh something my or other. God damn! Not Hayashibara. No, no. Uh, um, but like, oh, I she it kills was... it. And but that's the thing is like this. Um, this show is not trying to be that. Like that's the thing. You can't. I realize like this is why I like Seven. Like you can't criticize it for trying to be something it's not. No. And like everybody talks about how great Macross Plus is, and I, I, I am too. I will talk yes. Macross Plus to the moon. It's fucking incredible. But it's also not trying to be the original Macross. It's no. trying to be its own thing. And it's easier, I guess, to accept something structured like Macross Plus to be its own thing than something like Macross 7, which got, what, two seasons worth of fucking episodes? Yeah, Like, holy episodes. shit, man. Yeah. Plus, uh, plus a number of, like, little uh, OVAs. Man, oh, oh, so OVAs. Yeah. This actually is the show that got the most extra stuff, too. Like, which... And, and you know what? And a manga. I think it's well... Oh, did it? Yeah, I think it's well deserved. I do, too. And, I mean, it like, it had to have been somewhat successful for it to get all this spin-off stuff it had to have been i mean like and and it really is i mean like, i wouldn't be does... surprised if the show wasn't popular in japan like i wouldn't be surprised because usually this is what with some of these things is that like you know in the west doesn't do too well but because but as we've established in other videos you know anime and manga is primarily for a japanese audience and if the japanese like it that's primarily what's going to get you know d- that's it that's primarily what's going to succeed so I mean, it must be because they made like a fucking weird uh movie of like the macross frontier cast watching macross 7 it, it's so bizarre that they even made such a thing yeah because like, like it seems Ma- like in yeah. the west oh macross 7 black sheep but i wouldn't be surprised if saying mac I-, I might ask around uh, at some point but i wouldn't be surprised I- that say macross 7 wasn't like popular in japan I what, I, what i also what i also find interesting is that macross dyrl is uh a, fi- a legit film within the macross universe yeah and that's what i like about they, it too they talk about it they yeah, talk about it in, of, in the show about it where there's like oh my yeah. god were you that young um in my is that yes i was yes i was there mm, yeah you you see there there's one episode where they have like a couple of the war veterans and they're like playing for them at the old folks home uh obviously guys who are a lot older than max and Miria. yeah i know <laughs> but yeah dude um nah dude i i do want to say like though um yeah man Miria aged well especially when she's in that flight suit holy shit i i, I mean <laughs> yeah. she rocks uh, the fucking cougar look like holy fuck man damn it's like and i'm an older guy see i can't i can't i can't ogle mylene because well she's fucking 14 mm-hmm. and i'm in my 40s it's like that's against the rules yeah uh but nah nah i i, I wouldn't mind the um a uh mayor miria in her flight suit Daki makara you know the um <laughs> 
I, I, you okay, know, you hear that? I wouldn't Japan, mind one of them. Uh, get on that. Get on that. We need Cougar body Japan, anime. Cougar, we need, yeah, we, get on that shit. We, yeah, yeah, we do. We need. Look, we look need I know a few Japanese people. I'll ask them to like pass on. Like, listen, this guy from America wants anime Cougar Dokimakura. Get that done. We'll, we'll, we'll pay many, many dollar, many, mm. many dollar, many dollar. <laughs> and she's, you know, she's not even a. Uh, you know, she's 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 a Zentradi, man. You know, she's got that uh, fighting spirit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Remember the thing we talked about where you said that, like, she wanted to peg Max and that's partially why they broke up? Remember where that little discussion that. Was that was not me. That was not me. That was <laughs> not me. I, or or the, if, if, if somebody said that when I was around, I'm probably like, well, that's why they're separated is probably what I said if that's... Yeah, because I, I remember... Oh fucking memories playing tricks with me but i remember someone never br- someone brought that up might have been lolly or someone maybe i brought it up i forget but this is like you know wearing fairies where they broke up and it was like a joke one yeah maybe no it, it's 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 funny that's actually like one of the things about macross though is it's like the characters are really just so well defined like you kind of want to want to know what happened to them yeah, it's like, yeah. like that, that's I mean, another I mean, thing that's... A bit of in- i mean we do see a bit of in between stuff when like mylene's really young you know max got the long hair and you know she's kind of got like yeah. this kind of housewife housewife look you know she went from like housewife to like smoking cougar look within like a decade or two i'm like damn um, well, uh, that, jeans. that's the other thing that you know, irritated me is they don't actually resolve Resolve technically like th- that's really weird like there's this episode where Mylena uh they're like towards the end they're about to go on a suicide mission and Gomlin offers Mylena a, a diamond ring and he says like if I w- if I come back alive from this mission I want you to have this it's, it's like very serious mm-hmm. and, and then somehow Gomlin like Kamikaze is his plane and survives anyway and is kind of rather silly. And, and he comes back. Uh, but, like, that shit is never brought up again after that. And, like, even in the, like, sequel OVA, uh, Dynamite, which is, like, a year later, later Kur- uh, Gamlin and Mylena are still dating, but, like, th- there's no, like, final resolution there, which was sort of, like, interesting. And that's and, and that's the funny thing is because that question is never answered. If I recall, um, the Maximiria's granddaughter in um, Delta is not Mylene's kid. That's no, a, one of her else. older it's sisters. One, yeah, it's one of the older yeah. sisters. Yeah, so that's, like, the, she's her, you know, I mean, she's her, she's Mylene's niece in that, in that regard. But, like, yeah, the, um, that kind of, like, that's actually, like, it's a, I've discovered, it's a, this is a kind of American thing. Where we want, some extent, where we want the resolution? Uh, or maybe just, like, an English language thing, or an English language culture thing, like, Anglo-Saxon, like, culture thing where we want this full resolution because like if you think about it like i've watched a lot of european movies and a lot of, just like a lot, a lot of foreign movies and mm-hmm. like as soon as the conflict is resolved like the show ends um yeah there's and very little of like not... an epilogue um and, and, and yeah. actually um, a very interesting example of an epilogue so um i know most people here don't pay attention to like lot novel shit and stuff like that but uh, a show that got recently adapted you know if we're to you know strongest in the actual world so there's like there's a lot of a light novel of it, right? However, th- apparently there's like a sequel. Of, so, you know, they're trapped in another world, that type of shit. Gods are evil. I'm not going to spoil the plot. I'm not going to give you the full plot. But there is a book series or a web novel that takes place after that where they come back to like modern day Japan and shit with the main characters like overpowered and shit. And it's kind of like a continuation of what happens afterwards because it's like, okay, now that he's like powerful and shit and he's gone through all this trauma, how does he actually fit in to a modern day Japan when really, and, and you know, there's like some interesting things with the conflicts of the characters you where he's like, yeah, I killed your son and daughter because they became evil and corrupted. And, you know, you can hate me if you want that type of shit. Or there's the type of shit where some of the characters are like, you know, we were, we did some really fuck shit in the other world. And, you know, we want to go on a quest to kind of redeem ourselves. You know, we're going to stay here to the, you know, we're going to stay in Japan for a bit, say our goodbyes. But, you know, we're going back to the other world to try and like right some wrongs. Like there's a bunch of that shit going on. And I'm just kind of like, you know, that's very rare for like lot novels to do that. So, you know, after the main quest, main quest is done, you don't really get any like the aftermath or well, any you know, stuff Side that's, characters. That, yeah, and that's that's like a, kind of like the lack of a denouement kind of thing is not unusual. Is not unusual for a lot of different you know cultures storytelling, and it's just like yeah. I mean, you've got all these different conflicts going on, but once the main conflict is resolved, the story comes to an end. 
Yeah. It's like, boom, done, right? And it's like, well, what about all these dangling plots? Yeah, yeah, main oh, character just, defeats just the evil dressing. bad guy. They're just, you know, he... they're just backdrop. Yeah, backdrop. That's just you know, backdrop. Yeah, uh, but you know, uh, it's I, I, like, I kind of forget interesting that the guy is the author. It's like, oh, well, you know, he's been the main bad guy, but, you know, what happens when they go back home? What happens when they go back to Mon Japan? Let's go explore that, you know, some of the side character shit and, like, you know, the, regretting some of the mistakes they made in the other world and they've got all these powers and they're just like, you know, let's let's see what happens. That's actually rather interesting. Uh, it's that, yeah. that is a thing that happens in quite a few, like, a lot. Japanese stories I kind of noticed like it just kind of ends and any like loose plot threads it's like well hope they either have a sequel or uh, make your own fan fiction you know because yeah. there is that kind of lack of finality with some works yeah, yeah. you mentioned uh, a couple times by a Gundam that you really really liked uh, Mylene and Gambling together I mean do you have any thoughts on that or was it just sort of like a feeling you have it's more I like a feeling him, I had way. type of shit like it is it's, I... just, um, it's more like a feeling I kind of had um, not because I think like it it isn't just because I think they look cute together, but I think they'll actually probably. I think it'd be a nice. I think they'll have a really good relationship with each other. That's just kind of what I. That's just kind of like my. I can't really base this on anything. It's just kind of a feeling I have. I kind of disagree. I honestly think that they would end up in like this stereotypical like after the first couple kids are born, just like the complete boring sexless sexless marriage. The stereotypical Japanese sexless marriage where she views him as an older brother and like she's just devoted to the the the, the children and. He He's just like bored of well, the whole thing because he, he can't get none. He can't get no satisfaction. Speaking <laughs> of rock and roll, he can't get no da 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 satisfaction. I and imagine no that's whatever, but I love gun. Because the thing is, I don't I don't see her getting together with Basara mm. because Basara is well well. Let's put it this way: assume you could uh, tie Basara down, force him through the marriage ceremony, and force the ring on him, and set him free after that. How do you think that would go between him and Mylena? What do you mean? How, can, how do you set him free <laughs> when he's got a ring on his finger? Like, dude is, if like you said earlier, dude is a free spirit. He's his own boss. He can't be tied down, mm-hmm. right? Like, you know, he might he might be with a couple women here and there, but like, they're always a very specific type. Like, if you notice the kind of woman he attracts mm-hmm. is Rick, like, Smith, I could um, totally Rick, could Seville, like I could totally see him with Mylene's older sister yes the one, oh, fuck you know yes. yeah yeah they 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 lean into that this sort of weird scene where my yeah. sister is still giant as a zentradi and, she and he's there and they him. start yeah they start trying to kiss and he's and, and she's like kid. 30 feet tall and yeah and the little yeah. kid gets and the little way. kid jumps right into her mouth and she's like uh I Mom could kill runs. you right now. Please it's don't. Like, it's like, yeah. yeah. But, like... Because, honestly, yeah, here's the thing. Right. That, like, like, the thing. I don't think my lead would be a good fit for Basra. Like, the only people I'd see as a good fit for Basra would probably be, like, probably Rex or Civ- Seville. You know, because they don't mind... Because, tra- like, Rex is as wild as Basra is, and Seville, well, she travels. She likes Basra. She has anything tying her down. Well, uh, Rex, I don't know. She's wild like Basra, but Basra is... Basra is legit. She's fronting. Like, the rest of the biker gang she's just better at it yeah. i would honestly say she's fronting and 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 the rest of the biker gang is just better at front she's better th- than the rest of her gang th- yeah like honestly than, i could see her as that like housewife that has like y- you know that um there's a great example of this so there's a series called like the world Go- god only knows and you find out the main character's uh, mother used to be a biker gang and and like the main demon chick is like i'm your fa- i'm your husband's illegitimate child and then you see like the biker shit start coming back out and the main character's go like oh yeah my mom used to be part of a biker gang and we're like yeah we could see that like on- honestly i can kind of see rex falling back in that shit it's just like you know she's she's she has like housewife mode on and then when shirts the fan it's like biker chick i'm gonna kill you mode well that's kind of what miri is like if you think about it she's she's still the uh badass ace pilot deep down inside yeah, yeah. you know it I, I i love the scene it's like episode to 20 or so uh gambling borrows miri's old vf1 it's already been used quite a bit and like he gets it destroyed and ejects and, and Miria's response is my precious Valkyrie you got a lot of memories in that thing yeah yeah, they, that, yeah you know, that's where Grant, that's where child number two and three were made <laughs> oh 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 damn it would not surprise me I just love the. the I, I, OVA I mean, look, episode, look, though, look. With the I mean, women. This, is, this is literally the chick who's like dying in battle with my husband is the greatest honor. You don't think they were 
like, I would guarantee they did that once or fucking twice. Like, I guarantee fucking tear you to spice shit up. Is like, how about we fuck while we fly the Valkyrie in space? And Max's like, fuck yeah. I would guarantee you that's what happened. This is a family friendly <laughs> podcast. Fool, you know uh, me. Um, nothing about me is family friendly. <laughs> no, I know. Uh, but no, it, 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 it is. Yeah, yeah, no. At least. It, well, I mean, they. you can tell, like, they. you don't have that many kids if you ain't got chemistry, man. I mean, I, and that's the thing kids, is, I, I, that, that's I love the. Lot. That's why I love the episode where the uh, the Zentradi women um, attack the uh, the Macross 7. Oh, and yeah, then right. Max and Miria fly out together, and then they, you know, they, they kiss at, at in front of the. Uh, the, the the commander and like what's funny is like you see him start getting into it at first it's just like we're just going through the motions he's like yeah i know and they kiss and then like you know yeah, he max pulls it. her in he pull yeah he pulls yeah, him in time for and it's, number all, eight. Like, you can you can see like the the hormones are st- it's like you know there's a little bit of rust you gotta dust off blow the dust off of that but once you blow the dust off of that it starts running again and it <laughs> you can see what? oh he's starting to feel it it's like yeah he still got that what's shit. Also oh, great. Oh yeah. Yeah. What's also great in that OVA episode, there's a running thing all throughout Macro Seven of like the whoever's like one layer in charge up from you is incompetent and doesn't get it and uh and it's just an overall nuisance and so in that ova they've come across like a zentradi fleet that's like a hundred to one larger than them so of course there's a direct transmission from the un spacey fleet destroy those people we have no time to communicate with them fire up the macross cannon and exodor goes mm, as you wish and so what he does does is he completes transformation and he just fires the macross cannon into the air hitting and he nothing. misses yeah <laughs> deliberately misses yeah Exodor's the shit dude he was like one of my favorite characters in uh, yeah I, I, I love how Exodor's back again I'm just like oh sweet it's Exodor yeah yeah it, it, I, I wish he had more green time yeah they could have like, done more with him if they stuff. might if they micronized him but for whatever reason he just stays full size at all times yeah, I mean, because they micronized him in the original show, mm-hmm. but like, like I, I would have liked to have seen him, like you know, walking around in like his giant ass quarters and stuff, or something like that, right? Uh, Where, I, like, I, I even remember, like, at the end of that o- uh, uh, OVA, one of the, after like firing the the cannon into the air, one of the bridge bunnies sort of goes to him. <laughs> Uh, I'll go on a date with you anytime. Uh, uh, like, just sort of out of appreciation for what he did. And and he stares up and goes, you're breaking this old man's heart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, he's... Dude... Actually, no, I like, dude. I li- I like the uh, the platinum blonde bridge bunny at the about- Yeah, the bridge like, bunnies are great. Um, I wish we could see Bree Tide in used- the shirt. I wish we saw Bree Tide because that'd be cool. He's probably on Earth doing something else. It's better when you when uh like. This is something that a lot of, like, modern nostalgia shit, like, uh, the modern Star Wars doesn't get. If you're going to call back to, like, a previous show and have characters from back then, you can only be a handful. If you bring in too many, they're going to start to dominate the other cast and they're going to, like, take over the whole show. You can't have that. It has to be a handful, and Macross Seven understands that. You got Max, you got Miria, and then you, you got, got Exo off to the side, and that is it. Yeah, and, and the good. main the main focus stays on Basara. Um, yeah, Basara and and Mylene, and yeah, the, it, Max it, and, and Miria. Actually, Max and Miria feel integrated into this yes, because they're he, her parents. Exactly. I and mean, and a, a lot of the conflict is uh, they're. Uh, is the two of them like being a little worried for Mylena? They weren't exactly totally on board with her randomly joining this band, and, and then she starts to try and make herself a pilot for the band, and they are like 100% against it, and and they really try and lean on Ray to stop it and find a replacement for her. 
in Sound Force. Uh, but of course, what happens is Max says, "But of course, I leave the I'll leave the final decisions up to you." And Ray goes, "Yes, sir." Uh, and then Ray comes back at the end of the episode. Here's the Sound Force, and Mylene is part of it. And Max goes, "What? What, what is this?" Uh, and Ray goes, "Well, sir, you did say that I had final decision, and at the end of the day, we tried it. There's no one else we can come up with who's a good replacement for Mylene." He, he's yeah, I, I, I like how it is like that. Yeah between like his professional life and a bit of his personal life because it's like you know that's his daughter like you know it's a little yeah. different when you're sending someone else's kids to go out and die and it's like oh my god yeah that's uh, yeah you can understand why he's like that but at the same time both of those characters they ha they have a real maturity to them where they realize that once they've hit a certain age and Mylena is almost at that age like at 14 years old someone's going to do what they want to do and you can't stop them. You can't force them. Uh, at best, you can guide them. And, and, and so they, although the like initial response is they're horrified, they accept it and they go along with it. Yeah. Yeah. Just a heads up. I'm, I'm, um, dinner's almost gonna be ready for me soon. So anything else <laughs> um, the guys want to bring up before we wrap up? Uh, it's butter chicken tonight. Butter nice. chicken paneer. Nice. Like Indian? Yeah. Yo, um, can you hold on to that shit for like 19 hours? I'm gonna hop a plane and come over. Uh, I don't know. Like, we're probably gonna eat most of it. I'm sorry. Actually, I got. I actually, I, I could probably wait, get up tomorrow morning, and then go drive down to the nearest Indian restaurant and get some of my own. Yeah, yeah, we, time, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we're having butter chicken. Sometimes we have naan bread, but uh, due to current events, um, things have been a little tight. But uh, yeah, yeah, we're having butter yeah chicken. go figure, man. Yeah, go go figure. Who knew a four? Tyrion um, dictatorships are bad for the economy. Anyway, um, current mm. events aside, um, anything else you guys want to talk about before I've like drop out for a quick second and grab my dindin? Uh, you're gonna go grab it, or are we continuing to record? Yeah, or are we done? Um, does anything else you guys want to bring up, or do you guys want to wrap up? Uh, um, I'm Fulminatus signing off. Bye, everybody. Have a good one. Your turn. All right, sounds good. Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, Macro, se uh, yeah. So, uh, Macro Seven is a good show. You should watch it. Um, the soundtrack is great. Everything. Um, you see everything. Dece it's pretty decent. Um, Heraclius, any more ending thoughts? Listen to his song. Yeah, you, you heard it. Listen to um to his the song. Chad song. All right, peace out, everybody. Bye bye.